Good afternoon. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and you are watching a press briefing ahead of tomorrow's Crew-9 launch attempt. NASA and SpaceX are targeting tomorrow, September 28th, at 1.17 p.m. Eastern Time for liftoff of NASA astronaut Nick Haig and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Gorbanov to the International Space Station. Once there, they'll become part of Expedition 72 to maintain the orbiting lab and conduct groundbreaking research there. To take your questions about this mission, we have these folks here on the dais. To my left, we have NASA Associate Administrator Jim Free. Next to him, Ken Bowersox, Associate Administrator for NASA's Space Operations Mission Directorate. Steve Stitch, Manager, NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Dina Contella, Deputy Manager, NASA's International Space Station Program. Jennifer Buckley, Chief Scientist, NASA's International Space Station Program. And joining us virtually from Hawthorne, California, we have Bill Gerstenmeyer, Vice President, Build and Flight Reliability over at SpaceX. And then finally, back to the dais here, Brian Sizzix, Launch Weather Officer, 45th Weather Squadron, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. All right, thank you all for being here. We're being told to smile, we're smiling. <laughs> uh, let's go down the line with some opening remarks before we open it up for questions. So let's start with you, Jim. Great, thanks, Megan. And thanks to everybody uh, that'll be presenting today and for all of you for being here or, or, uh, or online. Um, as, as you'll hear more from Dina, it is a, continuing to be a busy time aboard the space station. And just about three weeks ago, many of our teams are working hard to bring Starliner home. And, I do want to take a moment to commend the NASA and Boeing teams for their diligence during that flight, uh, flight test and the commitment that we always have, all of our teams have, to flying safely. You might have things, thought uh, things would slow down after that, but as always, there's never a dull moment aboard Space Station. Uh, the week after Starliner's return, NASA astronaut Don Pettit launched aboard a Soyuz spacecraft with his two cosmonaut uh, partners on uh, September 11th and increased the station crew size to 12. Uh, the crew in space has been studying how plants grow in microgravity, conducting eye exams, and maintaining orbital plumbing systems and more, while teams at NASA and SpaceX on the ground prepared for the next set of operations. Monday of this week, Tracy Dyson returned to Earth and wrapped up a six-month mission aboard uh, ISS, uh, and it was absolutely awesome to see her face when she came out of that capsule, uh, smiling really big as she always does. We know that this launch is a bit unique and moving from the plan four crew members to two and teams on the ground, as I said, have been working to update Dragon's configuration to support the change. And I do wanna thank SpaceX for their support and flexibility to get us uh, here on the verge of launch. Um, I wanna thank all the teams that continue to impress us all with their dedication and ability to adapt and, and constant professionalism as well. We are continuing to pave the way for great things in space, and I look forward to everything this next crew will accomplish together. With that, let me turn it over to Sox. Hey, thanks, Jim. Hey, well, I appreciate all of you joining us here today. It's nice to see so many people who are interested in our missions, uh, and I know uh, you're probably as excited as I am to, to think about Crew 9 joining Expedition 72 on station, to think about Crew 8 coming home, and uh, all the great work that uh, Expedition 72 folks will be doing during their five months on orbit. Um, 
All of our missions have unique challenges, and uh, this one I think will be memorable for a lot of us. Um, first, uh, Hurricane Helene. Uh, the effect here was pretty uh, small, uh, just a, a little bit of a delay in our operations. We know there's folks uh, up uh, in the panhandle that had a, um, a, a much uh, larger impact from the storm, and we'll be thinking about them as we execute uh, the Crew 9 mission. Um, uh, and, uh, and I know our station folks are doing whatever they can now to try and help with the efforts up there. Um, we had a pretty big change in, uh, in our crew complement uh, for this mission, going from four people on the crew to two people on the crew so we could free up a couple of empty seats. It's so impressive to see the professionalism of our astronaut team, uh, both Nick and Alexander, as they've dealt with the changes that uh, they have to make so that they can uh, handle the ascent and prepare to integrate with the new crew, but also Zena and Stephanie, who gave up their seats on this mission. Uh, I just want you to know we're going to find spots for them to fly, uh, and, and we really appreciate um, how hard it is to give up a mission and, and wait a little bit longer. Um, and then we've got two pads. We've moved to a new launch pad. It is great to have that flexibility uh, to be able to use either 39A or, or, or Slick 40 for launches. Uh, and uh, you'll hear more about that from, uh, from, from Steve and, and Gerst. But um, it, I am really happy to see us able to, to execute off of either pad. Um, <laughs> My job is to kind of cheerlead and, uh, and, and watch the work of our programs. And I am so proud of the commercial crew team, the ISS team, our, our partners at SpaceX and the work they've done here today. And uh, I know you're eager to hear about the details of their work, so I'll pass over to Steve now. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for those uh, kind words. And thank all of you for joining us here today and appreciate your continued interest in the commercial crew program and human spaceflight. Um, Super excited about this flight. It's great to be back here in Florida, getting ready to launch uh, uh, Nick and Alex uh, on their way on Crew-9. Uh, it's an important flight for us in many ways, but uh, as Ken mentioned, this is our first flight off of Pad 40. We started working on this capability a couple years ago. Um, our teams worked very hard to certify the pad. We completed that certification um, through the flight readiness process. Uh, that pad's ready to go. A lot of hard work by our team um, in working hand in hand with the uh, FAA and the Eastern Range, and then it's great to be on the Space Force side for our first launch. Um, we had our launch readiness review this morning. Uh, we are proceeding toward launch uh, and go to proceed toward the launch time of 1.17 p.m. Uh, tomorrow on Saturday the 28th. We rolled out a little late this morning. You know, we had to go back uh, to the hangar for the hurricane and uh, got out there a little bit late. We are vertical at the pad, and the next big activity will be loading the cargo uh, here this afternoon and then getting ready for, for flight. We do have backup opportunities. Uh, uh, if we don't make, uh, if the weather's not good or we don't make it, uh, Sunday, September the 29th uh, and the 30th, we have opportunities on the range. Uh, if we launch on Saturday, we'll dock on Sunday, September 29th at about 5.30 Eastern, it's about a 28-hour rendezvous uh, from the pad to the space station. As you know, we've been watching the weather all week with Hurricane Helene. Uh, my thoughts and prayers are with those in the, uh, in the Panhandle area of Florida that have gone through the bad weather. Uh, but we were able to get out and do our static fire and dry dress on Tuesday before the weather hit. That went really well. We were able to get uh, Nick and Alex into the vehicle, get their suits checked out, their seats checked out. That went fine. And then uh, late that evening, we did a static fire of the vehicle and checked out the six uh, M1D engines in the first stage, loaded the second stage with the propellant, and that went well. Then we buttoned up the vehicle, did some inspections of the engines, buttoned up the vehicle, brought it back into the hangar, and then, then rolled back out. Uh, Bill will talk a little bit more about the operation uh, for static fire, but we did have a couple issues uh, on the pad. The chilled water system that's used for Dragon, this provides uh, cooling up into the Dragon spacecraft. We had a little bit of a leak, a relief valve relieved right close to launch. The uh, SpaceX team have gone back in and fixed that valve, and uh, we don't think we'll have a problem for launch. Um, and then we had um, a very unusual problem where, of course, the, the, the LOX RP um, Merlin engines produce soot as a byproduct, and at pad 40, that soot goes out and exhaust out to the east toward the water, 
and uh, the, the wind of the day blew that soot back over onto the Dragon spacecraft. So when we rolled the vehicle back in, we inspected Dragon and we found soot in several areas on the vehicle. We were able to work through that, clean the solar arrays, clean several areas, go in and do some repainting of the Dragon spacecraft. Um, the SpaceX team did an incredible job of repainting, in particular uh, quadrants one and um, a little touch up on four, and uh, got it all cleaned up and ready to go. Paint is important for space flight in that it has to be designed to both absorb heat and keep things uh, warm and then also reject a certain amount of energy from the sun. And so we went worked through all that. We have a couple things to close out, but we're, uh, we're really on track for flight. Uh, let's see, we're also flying uh, for the first time in, since Crew-4, a second flight booster. When we moved this launch uh, out to September, we allowed SpaceX to go take our 1085 booster and fly another Starlink flight. It's good for us to get that data, but our team had to work through some certification, um, and we worked through all that. Uh, of course, we've been following the, the fleet and the Starlink uh, anomalies, the Stage 2 anomaly on, on the MVAC. We worked through that with SpaceX. We also worked through the hard landing with SpaceX. They've been doing a great job of sharing data with us. A couple other unique things I'll mention, uh, capabilities of the Dragon vehicle. Uh, we have a unique capability for the first time on Crew-8 and Crew-9. Uh, it's an emergency contingency capability for landing where if the main parachutes were all to fail, uh, the Super Draco thrusters will fire right before um, the vehicle would make contact with the water and, and then it would be an emergency configuration to, to save the crew on a really bad day. So that's enabled and gonna fly for the first time on Crew-8. And then for Crew-8, we also extended our capability. You know, we have a 210-day certified limit of Dragon, which is about October 1st uh, for this, and we've extended that out by 30 days. So we had to go through and look at the windows, the structure, all the rotating machinery, the avionics, the thermal protection system, the prop systems, and we went through that certification and uh, extended it out to 240 days. We'll have a little longer handover from uh, Crew-8 to Crew-9. Uh, and that's really to deconfigure the Crew-8 uh, emergency return and seats uh, for Butch and Sonny. If we could go to a graphic, we have a couple of graphics I'd like to show. The first one, uh, this is uh, what uh, the contingency seat configuration looks like. We posted this out on our, our blog site, but this is uh, uh, the seat that uh, Butch and Sonny will ride on. There's some straps. Uh, it's uh, the space station program allowed us to use some of the foam and some configuration. And, and this is out there for you to, to see. And I think we have one more shot of kind of what the normal config is. This is the normal config of the cockpit where you see the four seats, uh, the, the commander and pilot sit in the middle of S2 and 3. And then we have uh, C5, C6, and C7 cargo locations. You can see bags uh, and cargo that are typically there. That was removed on Crew-8 for the contingency configuration. So we'll take a little bit of time to deconfigure those, those seats. Um, uh, other than that, uh, we're ready to go. We're watching the timeline very carefully over the evening. We've got a couple things to close out, uh, but we're excited to be here. I really would like to thank our entire CCP team, uh, the SpaceX team. Uh, the word that comes to mind for this flight is agility. Lots of agility in terms of changing the manifest, uh, changing the cargo config, and being ready to go fly off pad 40. And then um, I'd also like to thank um, the FAA, the, um, the Coast Guard, the United States Space Force, uh, DOD DET-3, that's our partners for crew rescue, mm -hmm. and then the Eastern Range all contribute to making this flight possible. With that, I'll turn it over to Dina. All right. Thank you, Steve. So uh, we've had a lot of great reviews leading up to this point, and I'll uh, just say that the International Space Station is ready um, and excited to receive the vehicle and its crew. Um, we um, are looking forward to the docking, as Steve mentioned, seven, uh, at uh, 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, thereabouts, uh, on Sunday. And then soon after that, we'll have hatch opening around 7.15 p.m., and then a welcome home ceremony a few minutes, uh, a few minutes later. Uh, so as Steve mentioned, we'll, we'll have a little bit longer handover, so we'll call it, we call it a seven plus two, so seven full days of handover plus the docking day and the undocking day. We're targeting approximately October 7th. Uh, as many of you are aware, that date could vary um, depending on uh, where, um, you know, for example, if we have good weather or not in Florida for a splashdown, which would then uh, tell us whether we can or can't uh, undock on that day, uh, wh whether or not our handover is going well with the crew. Uh, so, um, but that's approximately the target date that we're looking for. 
So we have currently nine crew on board ISS. We have the four Create guys, uh, and we have the, the three 72S Soyuz guys that just arrived. As Jim mentioned, we're excited that uh, we had a great uh, crew exchange uh, earlier with the Soyuzes earlier this month. Um, and then, of course, we have Butch and Sunny. And so then when Nick and Alex arrive, that'll be 11. Um, but we'll quickly get back down to our standard complement of seven. Uh, and so that's uh, good from a uh, planning perspective and consumables and manifesting for us uh, in terms of hardware. Um, I'll mention that Sunny Williams is the commander of the International Space Station and will be for the next uh, several months. Um, and, um, I, you know, I'll just say the next several months are going to be very busy. Jim alluded to us being very busy. Uh, I will say we're absolutely, ISS is a busy place. Uh, so, uh, first, um, very soon after Crew 8 undocking, we're going to do a uh, port relocate where uh, the Crew Dragon that we're sending up now, Crew 9, will be relocated to the Zenith port. Uh, and then um, we'll uh, be doing the, our Russian crew will be ingressing the aft progress to be uh, un offloading cargo around mid October. And then at the end of October, we've got the SpaceX 31 mission. Uh, that mission is going to have a lot of science. We're looking forward to that. And uh, Jennifer, to my left, our si chief scientist, is going to uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, it's about a month-long mission, and then we'll be doing a progress exchange, meaning that we'll, on the Zenith port, on the Russian segment, we'll have a progress undock, and then we'll have a progress launch and dock, uh, bring up a fresh progress for the Zenith around mid-November. And then in the December and January time frame, we are starting to plan for three EVAs, um, approximately three EVAs in that time frame, uh, on the U.S. operating segment, and then possibly there may be a Russian EVA as well uh, that will take place uh, in the December time frame. So a lot is going on um, in that regard. Uh, as you know, we have um, hundreds, of, hundreds of experiments ongoing on ISS, uh, and I'll just, I would like to highlight a couple. I wanted to point out that we'll be uh, on this upcoming expedition, we'll be growing lettuce and uh, we'll be looking for um, its um, mo moisture conditions and how that impacts its nutritional quality, how it impacts my microbial growth. Um, but, you know, lettuce is something that folks can relate to, so I wanted to poke on that one. Uh, I'll, I'll say that the um, another experiment um, is uh, that I wanted to highlight is that we'll be studying crew member vision changes. And we do that, um, uh, we do that it's sort of ongoing. Um, this particular experiment, though, we'll be testing whether or not vitamin B would uh, prevent or mitigate some of the issues that we're having um, with our crew member's eyes. So those are a couple of items. I, I did want to also mention uh, that um, you know, Jennifer will give a little bit more detail, but um, we are going to, to be training all of our assets uh, on the hurricane and uh, its aftermath uh, to try to help folks out. Um, there's some standard cameras and such, but uh, as well, uh, we go through our science community uh, to, to, try to, to try to help where we can. So I want to uh, thank the entire team for getting us to this point, the, the International Space Station team, including the international partners. I want to thank the Commercial Crew Program and SpaceX, uh, uh, all of our partners, uh, for getting us uh, up to this point. Um, you know, the, like I said, the ISS is ready, and we are really looking forward to seeing this crew on board. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you, Dina. As Dina mentioned, uh, it's going to be a very busy increment, um, and science is no exception. We have a fast-paced um, plan for the crew. We typically, in any given increment, fly anywhere from 200 to 250 investigations, and right now um, that is roughly what's planned for increment 72. We have a variety of science that we're going to be doing on ISS, from biological to physical sciences, space science, tech demos, human research, STEM and outreach, as well as earth science. Dean also mentioned as part of our earth science support, um, right now we are supporting the disaster response coordination system by providing imagery from both um, our cameras and assets on board, um, as well as crew uh, when they're available um, and we have available targets um, in support of Hurricane Helene. So we will continue that um, as the storm progresses. There are a couple um, experiments I just want to highlight for this increment coming up. Um, it was mentioned that the crew is going to be doing an EVA in December, and one of those objectives is to repair NICER, which is one of our external instruments. NICER is the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. It's an X-ray telescope, which is located external um, on ISS. 
and it's taking a look at neutron stars. Neutron stars are the glowing cinders that are left behind after a massive uh, explosion in a supernova, and they're the densest objects in the universe. NICER studies the extraordinary physics of these stars. In May of 2023, NICER developed a light leak, and that allows unwanted sunlight to enter the instrument, and it was a result of damage to the filters that cover NICER, NICER's X-ray concentrators. So this damage does allow the sunlight to reach the detectors inside, degrading the science during daytime. We still are able to uh, get valuable science from the instrument um, during, uh, during nighttime, um, but um, this has been a, uh, a really robust um, instrument. Um, it's published um, one of the highest numbers of publication rates we've had on ISS, and we're looking forward um, to going out and repairing um, those filters with a patch um, so we can get NICER um, back up to its full capability. We do have some science actually flying on uh, the Crew-9 vehicle with the crew. Uh, one of those investigations is rhodium plant life. This is through the ISS National Lab. It is the LEO Integrated Floriculture Experiment, LIFE, uh, which studies how radiation and gravitational forces at different orbital altitudes affect plant physiology. The plant they're going to be looking at for this is Arabidopsis. This is one of our model organisms we study very frequently, um, also known as mustard seeds. Um, and they're going to be taking a look at both a wild-type normal plant as well as a genetic um, mutant to see what the response is to varying um, radiation. A sister experiment was flown on the commercial uh, flight Polaris Dawn recently. And we will compare, or the researchers will compare that um, with the samples that are coming back from ISS. This is also the first mission using uh, new hardware for this experiment. The second experiment uh, I want to highlight that's going to be flying on the vehicle with the crew is genes in space. This is also flying through the ISS National Lab, and this is a student experiment. Uh, their genes in space program partners students with practicing scientists um, to study genetics on ISS. Uh, this one is taking a look at how space flight may uh, activate retrotransposons. So these are mobile fragments of genetic code that insert themselves into host DNA. This is a common occurrence, but when it's inserted into disadvantageous regions, this can cause issues um, here on the ground. It can lead, lead to um, different diseases, um, including things like cancer. So understanding the behavior of how these activate and may behave in microgravity um, or could be induced by stress responses um, could shed light on potentially some uh, genetic risks or how this mechanism works. Um, so this particular experiment is going to be looking at both the mechanism as well as a new way um, of imaging uh, these um, segments of DNA. And then Dina also mentioned the plant habitat experiment. Um, this is going to be outgrowing our outrageous red romaine lettuce, um, and it's going to be under several different water stress conditions. Uh, so we're going to be looking at drought, flooding, and then alternating uh, drought and flooding where we basically um, rescue a plant after it has experienced drought and then normal conditions as well. Um, so we'll be taking a look at um, how that impacts the plant overall as well as the microbiology of the plant. Thank you so much. Uh, interesting uh, science, as always. Uh, let's now bring in Bill, again, joining us virtually from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. Bill, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine, and it's great to be with you today. Again, on behalf of the SpaceX team, it's uh, really a privilege to be part of this amazing activity on board Space Station and these crew rotation flights. Um, as we talked about earlier and the teams talked about, the ability to be agile, to shift and move things around is extremely important. And being able to launch off a of pad 40 for the first time with crew is also pretty exciting. So I think the teams are ready. We did a detailed uh, launch readiness review today. We've got the vehicle back out on the pad. We're in the drag and starting to configure things. We've got some uh, cargo to get loaded and put in place and, and get ready to go. You know, also this week, we did a detailed review of the Polaris Dawn mission where we went over all the uh, details of that mission. We got an extremely detailed look at the Dragon vehicle in free flight for an extended period of time. That information then carries over directly to this mission we're about ready to go do. So we have extra confidence in our Dragon systems. We have extra confidence in our Draco thrusters and the fact that we've, we did some really demanding burns on that mission and they all worked extremely well. We made some changes to the humidifier, dehumidifier system on board Dragon. We got to check those out again on Polaris Dawn, and we brought that forward. 
We also got a lot of good comments from the Polaris Dawn crew, and we'll make sure we share that with the broader spaceflight community and make sure we all learn together, because again, this is really a team effort moving forward. As Steve talked about, um, you know, we had excellent weather information, so we were able to, to complete the uh, dry dress activity and the static fire, and then we knew the winds would be too high for our vehicle to stay out on the pad, so we were able to lower the vehicle, get it into the hangar, safely ride out the storm, and then when the winds passed this morning, we were able to get back out after the, uh, the winds had passed and we're back in a satisfactory configuration, get the vehicle ready to go fly. Also, as Steve talked about, we had a kind of unique situation where the winds were pretty much out of the east and it blew some soot back on the Dragon vehicle. Uh, we saw that on the Dragon vehicle, we cleaned it off, and then we went ahead and repainted some areas, um, especially on the radiators. It's important that the radiators radiate heat at the proper way to space. So we had to put some, some new paint on to, to get that back to the right uh, emissivity and the right reflectivity and absorptivity of the of the solar radiation that hits those panels so they'll reject the heat properly. I think it's kind of neat that this, some of the uh, the paint we use was actually tested on board space station as part of the materials and space experiment. So we took data from the space station and how this paint degrades over time on station. We were able to use that to make sure we had the right formulated paint to go put on the Dragon to go fly. So here's space station helping Dragon to go service space station to transport crew. So again, an ultimate team experience of us sharing data back and forth and moving forward. So on behalf of the SpaceX team and, and all the folks here in Hawthorne, we're really ready to go support this mission and we're ready to move forward. And I'll turn it over to, to Brian who can give us the latest on the weather. Thanks, Bill. And a member of the press corps commented that it was a good sign that I was smiling. Well, we'll call more of a, call more of a soft smile. We'll leave it at that. Um, but yeah, anyway, you know, it's been a busy few days here, obviously, with the impacts from Helene, which was Hurricane Helene, now Tropical Depression Helene. And, and as be, has been mentioned here, we did avoid the worst of the impacts here on the east coast of Florida. We had some outer rain bands push through with some heavy rains. We did experience tropical storm force winds here with some higher gusts to about the low 60s knots, which is the highest we experienced on any of our towers that go up to 300 feet on the Cape and, and Kennedy Space Center. Um, and of course, I echo the sentiments of my fellow panelists. We're thinking about the folks that really took the brunt of the storm uh, in the Panhandle through Georgia, South Carolina, all the way up to some of the severe flooding we're seeing in, in Western North Carolina. And that's really um, where we are seeing right now where the storm is now centered. So it's pushed well to our north. Let's take a live look at some satellite imagery. Uh, the National Hurricane Center has analyzed the center of what is now Tropical Depression, Helene, to be in Western North Carolina, Eastern Tennessee region. And typically with hurricanes as they pass through, especially this time of the year, they get into the upper level westerly winds that help push it farther to the northeast, and that helps drier air filter in behind it. This is a bit of an abnormal situation where it's interacting with an upper level low just to the west, and that's helping pull it pull the center of the storm a little bit further west. So how that impacts us is, is, as you see, there's this tail that goes out off the Carolina coast and wraps back down towards Florida. One of my colleagues, Arlena, calls it a tropical trailing trough. And what happens is that's going to kind of get stuck on top of us. So it's, it's going to lead this remnant boundary that will focus moisture uh, in central Florida and along the ascent corridor as well. So that will help to some degree increase the precipitation and potentially lightning chances um, in our area through the next few days as we get our typical afternoon heating. We're still in the wet season here in Florida, so in the afternoon we do see some storms and, and showers that develop due to the, the afternoon heating that we get here on the peninsula. So let's go to our, our launch forecast here. You can see we are at a 45% probability of violation or 55% chance of go with this instantaneous launch window at 1.17 p.m. tomorrow. I'd be a little more pessimistic if it was later in the afternoon. That's when the bulk of the shower and storm activity typically in this type of pattern with south south uh, westerly flow. But I think it'll be just before the worst of the, the storm coverage develops. But we will be watching some popped up showers and storms that form uh, on the peninsula and start moving from, from west to east. So we'll be watching those, 
kind of hit or miss pop-up showers. And uh, that's what we will be tracking here at the launch site uh, for that opportunity tomorrow. And then as we go to the next day, a pretty similar pattern, but it, the launch window does move 20, 25 minutes earlier. So that actually does help a little bit in terms of the, the afternoon heating that we see. So we, we bump up the probability of go a little bit up to 60%. And then of course, for, for all crude launches, it's not just the weather at the launch site that we're watching. We're working very closely with uh, our colleagues over at the Space Flight Meteorology Group in, in Houston, and we're monitoring the weather along the ascent corridor. So there's some key points that we're looking at in terms of winds, waves, precipitation, lightning, among other criteria. And in this case, the winds and waves generally look pretty good along the ascent corridor. The watch item will be uh, precipitation and lightning. So we'll be monitoring that in real time tomorrow, both at the launch site and along some, some points along the ascent corridor. But hey, no matter what Mother Nature throws at us, the, the launch weather team will be ready to go and we'll be uh, obviously watching things very closely. Megan, back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys, for those opening remarks. We're now going to open it up to questions. For those in the room, you know the drill. Raise your hand. Wait for a mic to get to you. For those on the phone, press star one to get into the question queue. And then to remove yourself from the queue, that would be star two. OK, let's start with Marcia here. Then Associated Press, um, probably for Steve, but I'm not sure. Is the plan still to fly up the one SpaceX suit for Butch? There's already one up there for Sunny. Is that still the plan? And anything else you're taking specifically for those two? And I know you guys like to rotate crews every six months, but what would have prevented you from cutting this mission a little short after a couple months to bring those two home sooner and just is it easy to rotate your missions and be more flexible in how you schedule them, or is it too much in stone to always want to do a spring and a fall? I, if you could just explain it. Because when I tell my neighbors and people that you're going up to get them, they think they're coming back right away, and they're perplexed, as am I. OK, yeah, I'll, I'll adjust your questions, Marshall. Yeah, in terms of the suits, there's uh, Sunny has a suit on an orbit. She's tried that suit on. That suit does fit. We are carrying up a suit for a butch uh, on uh, Crew 9. We're also carrying up a few other things. There's some uh, earpiece components that go with the suit, some umbilicals that we'll need to fly up. Those are all going up associated with the suits. Um, and so that's the main hardware that's going up for Butch and Sunny uh, that, we, that I would like to talk about. Um, you know, we talked a lot about what to do in terms of uh, when to rotate them back down. Uh, you know, when we look at the vehicles that we have ready um, and the flights, it just made a lot of sense to go ahead and rotate them back down with Crew 9 and have the two empty seats. And then obviously the Crew 8 vehicle, you know, wasn't right, the right time to bring them back down. And so we could, you know, schedule it a little shorter increment, then I'd have to have another vehicle ready. And so when we work with SpaceX, uh, that next vehicle for Crew 10, that's going to be in the February time frame. That's a brand new Dragon we're trying to get ready. We'd like to fly that Dragon and space out kind of the flights across all the Dragons. And so really that was the reason. And we'll just keep Butch and Sunny there a little longer, about eight months. Um, of course, Nick and Alex will stay for the about five months, and then we'll bring them back down. So it's a brand new Dragon. And really, really it's, a, it's how do we space out these flights, right? So um, Great. We'll go to Will right behind Marsha there. Thank you. Hi, Will Robinson Smith with Space Flight Now. Thanks so much for taking the time. Um, question for Steve and perhaps Ken. How was the decision made on who would remain flying on Crew 9? I imagine um, Alex's seat was probably secure with the, the seat swap with Roscosmos, but how was it decided that Nick Haig would be the one to remain on this mission as opposed to Xena, who was training as commander? Thanks. Um, well, we turned that over to our team in FOD. Um, and, and they looked at um, kind of the skill mix of the crew and decided that it made the most sense to have Alexander and Nick fly together and, and move Xena to a later flight. Um, but it, I know it was a really close call for them. They, they were thinking very hard about flying Xena. Uh, but, but in this situation, it, it made sense to have somebody who had at least one flight under their belt aboard the vehicle. Okay, and and Steve may have more to add there. No, I think you answered it very well, Ken. Let's keep it on this side of the room right there. Behind Will. Uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I think this is for Steve. Um, we know this is a crew rotation mission. There's a certain segment that's calling it a rescue mission. Does the description of this mission fall maybe some place in the middle? And if so, what would that be? 
Yeah, I, I really look at it as a crew rotation mission where we, you know, are going to rotate the crews and, and we just happen to have two crew members already there a little early. So really, in my mind, it's, it's bringing Butch and Sonny back at the end of an increment. They have really joined the space station increment team. They're doing increment ops now. And so, you know, when they return on Crew 9 um, in the late February time frame, it's really part of a rotation versus a rescue mission. Okay. This side of the room right here. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Thanks for all the great information. Uh, my question is for Bill and Steve and, and Ken, actually. I would like to follow up on the Polaris Dawn. You did, um, you went into a high radiation environment and you completely decompressed the, uh, the, the, uh, the dragon. I'd like to know what, what did you learn? Did, you, did anything go wrong or what, what was the good things that you learned about it? And how would that, with the radiation and the decompression, how will that help um, the, uh, the ISS missions and the Artemis missions to the moon? Thanks. Yeah, I can, I can answer some of those if you want. Uh, I would say, first of all, I think, you know, we have a contingency case where we can depress the Dragon capsule. And, you know, we, we tested that before on the ground, but we've never really tested that in space. So now what was a kind of an untested contingency case has now been fully tested. Um, the high radiation environment, we got to build a lot of auto sequences that actually rebooted hardware and recovered the hardware automatically without any interaction from the crew. So again, I think that helps us have a more robust capsule that that demonstrates what it needs to go do as we do the transportation missions to and from space station. I think also as we look further out and we're gonna do things around the moon in a higher radiation environment, getting some experience there is important, checking out the new spacesuits and getting mobility uh, with, that we do with Polaris Dawn is there. So I see these as very complementary activities that we use the Polaris Dawn mission to stretch some capabilities, to prove some capabilities that then actually show we have the robustness and reliability needed for the, the missions to and from space station. Yeah, you wanna go, Steve? From, from our perspective, you know, we, we got to follow along with a lot of the development of Polaris Dawn, uh, the suit development and the chambers at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, as Bill said, there's a couple things that really uh, we benefit from. We do have a contingency case for every Dragon mission. If there were uh, some event in the atmosphere you needed to purge it out, we can lower the pressure, even take it to vacuum. So uh, we've, ne we've tested that on the ground, as Bill said, but now they did it on orbit. Uh, we can learn, as you repress, how the ecosystem performs, uh, the, the rates and the cooling and, and so forth and the components to make sure that all works just fine. Uh, it was a stressing entry uh, for the heat shield, I would say. A little higher velocity, a little higher orbit. We get to benefit from that in terms of looking at how the heat shield performs. Every time we come back, we actually flew the NASA WV-57 aircraft for uh, the Polaris Dawn mission to image the parachutes and watch their inflation and watch how they performed. And then we sit side by side with SpaceX when they bring the vehicle back and look through the parachute data um, and then see how the parachutes perform. So that benefits us. Uh, for every single flight, and and then re really, it also stressed the ecosystem. I would say they stayed on orbit for about five days. You know, our missions are pretty short duration, about a day to space station and a day on the way back. And so we learn from how uh, Polaris Dawn stresses the ecosystem. And I'll let Ken talk about the exploration aspects. Yeah, and from from a headquarters point of view, I I love the Polaris Dawn missions. They they show what we're trying to do as we develop the commercial. Leo low Earth orbit um, ecosystem. Um, they uh, uh, show the advantages of allowing providers to own the vehicles and use them in, in different ways that the government might not think of. Uh, but really selfishly, I, I like them because I don't have to pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have vehicles in the flow that if there was a crisis on station, uh, uh, SpaceX could work with us to talk to the Polaris Dawn team and, and see if we could get access to that vehicle uh, first. Uh, for some sort of contingency. And, and our human research folks, uh, especially uh, um, our, our team at the Translational Research Institute for, uh, for Space Health, Trish, um, they, um, they work with the Polaris Dawn teams to gather science data on those missions, and we benefit from that science data, the radiation data that you mentioned. So there's lots of great things about it. Okay, thank you so much for that question. We'd like to give our folks uh, on the phone a chance to ask a question now. Let's go to Jonathan Siri of Fox News. 
thanks so much for doing this. My question is for Steve. For the backup launch days on Sunday and Monday, what are the specific times you're looking at? And then if you could explain for a general audience how you determine an instantaneous launch window. Are you looking for the most efficient trajectory to the ISS or the safest trajectory or both? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first question. Uh, the backup launch times on Sunday, September 29th, it's 12.54 uh, p.m. Eastern in the afternoon, so it gets a, about 23 or 24 minutes earlier a day. And then on Monday, the launch time is 12.32 p.m. Eastern. Um, and both those dockings are uh, roughly uh, 28 hours or so. So um, the, the way the launch window gets determined is, is, is a little complicated. If you think about... Um, the space station orbit, uh, the orbit is at a 51.6 .6 degree inclination about the Earth, and uh, essentially it rotate as the Earth rotates, we rotate into the plane of the space station orbit. And that happens, and we want to launch to the north, so it happens uh, once, once a day for the launch site here at the Kennedy Space Center. And so that launch time that we choose is a launch time that allows us to to launch in the most efficient propellant manner with uh, both the Dragon propellant and then the Falcon 9 propellant, such that we get into that orbit uh, at the right time to expend the least amount of propellant. We have altered the, the launch trajectory a little bit compared to most of the, the Falcon 9 flights that SpaceX flies to, to optimize for abort, so we fly what I would call a little bit more depressed trajectory uh, to make sure that the Gs aren't too high uh, should the capsule have to leave the launch vehicle and reenter. Uh, but it's really that we choose a time such that we minimize the propellant and, and, and launch uh, into the space station orbit that comes by once a day. So. Great. Thank you for that question. Jeff Faust, uh, Space News, also on the phone. Hey, good afternoon. A uh, question for Bill Gerstenmeier. Curious, uh, any lessons learned from the four years of flying uh, Crew Dragon missions from Pad 39A that you applied when you were setting up the uh, crew tower and systems at Pad 40? Thanks. Yeah, I think we, we carried uh, a lot of the things forward from 39A into Pad 40. I, I don't think there's anything too special there. I think you'll see the, uh, the crew escape system where we have the slide wires at uh, 39A. We have slide chutes at 40. Uh, we think those are actually more effective for uh, the crew at, in an emergency case exiting the launch tower. Um, those are actually a little more convenient than the uh, than the baskets that are kind of a one-way one-way device. These can be used multiple times and they're deployed. Uh, but I think in general we we optimize some of the dragon systems, some of the cooling systems, some of the uh, water systems on the pad are more optimized for dragon and for those activities than they are at 39A. So I, I think we. We picked up a little bit from 39A and moved it to 40, but in general, it, it's it's a, it's roughly the same capability in both pads. Great. All right, one more uh, in the room. Oh, no, sorry, one more on the phone. Stephen Clark, Ars Technica. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I think my question's probably for Gerst as well. Can you talk about the contingency capability for a propulsive splashdown? I know that was a part of the original vision for uh, Crew Dragon, and it sounds like you're bringing back some of that capability, at least in the contingency mode. How did you uh, certify this for this mission? Yeah, we've actually flown it on several other Dragon flights before this. This is the first time it flies on a, on a NASA mission. The, the way it works is in the case where all the parachutes totally fail, this essentially fires the thrusters at the very end that essentially gives the crew a, a chance uh, to, to land safely and essentially uh, escape the vehicle. So it's it's not used in any, you know, partial conditions. You know, we can land with one shoot out. We can land with uh, other failures on the, in the shoot system. But this is only in the case where all four parachutes just do not operate. In that case, the, the capsule detects that there's a problem and it fires the essentially the Draco thrusters at the very end and then provides a, a tolerable landing for the crew. So it's a it's a true deep, deep contingency. But again, I think our philosophy is rather than have a system that you don't use, even though it's not maybe fully certified, but it gives the crew a chance to escape a really, really bad situation, we put that in place. And, and that's the way this 
uh, propulsive landing system works. All right, let's go back to the room before going back to the phones. Right here, thank you. Maybe this is a bit of overkill. I'm Jean Wright from Space Up Close. I have another question about the soot condition, how caustic it was, what kind of composition was there. When we did surface prep on, sur on the shuttle, that's the first thing I thought of. We had to do surface prep before we did anything to it. And I'm just wondering with the conditions, sorry, with the hurricane conditions, we had to maintain certain specs for humidity and temperature. And I know it's done inside. Uh, can you tell us what kind of paint? Is it proprietary? It probably is. I'm just curious <laughs> to what, what kind of, because it is a special conditions with the storm, how you were able to maintain all that with the specs that we used to have to do for shuttle. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start and then see if Bill has anything to add. Yeah, the, the paints that SpaceX uses are typical space, space grade paints. Uh, what happened was when the soot got uh, onto the various parts of Dragon, the first thing we tried to do was go wipe it off, right? Um, it w wiped off most of the areas pretty well. The solar arrays, we were able to just wipe it off and clean it to make sure. Obviously, you don't want to degrade the solar arrays. You want to make sure that it has a, a good charging capability. It wiped off a lot of what's called the, the SPAM, a lot of the thermal protection system. The one area that we had some trouble is there's a special paint used on the radiators. Uh, we had a lot of trouble getting that, uh, uh, the soot off of there. And so it essentially, that paint is a bit porous and so it kind of absorbs the, the hydrocarbon soot. Um, and so since we couldn't wipe it off, we went in, SpaceX did a wonderful job of adding about three coats of paint to that area. Uh, this is primarily on quadrant one on the radiator on the trunk. We had to go then look at that uh, additional paint and okay, what does that do to the radiator now that um, it's not gonna quite radiate the heat uh, just right. And so we looked at all the different cases, uh, both in transit to space station and then while we're docked, we also have the capability to do um, what we call a safe haven. So in other words, if something happens, the crew can get in Dragon and uh, close the hatch and then use Dragon to reject the heat. And that was the one case that was uh, was the driving case for uh, analyzing it. And so that, so we were able to pass that case. Um, it didn't really hurt the TPS per se and chemically, you know, uh, the hydrocarbon, once we wiped it off, we didn't have any concern for the TPS. Uh, but it's something that was unique at pad, you know, at pad 39A, the flame trench goes to the north and we've just never had the wind in such a direction to where it would blow it. It's also a little longer flame trench at 39A. So uh, we'll go take a look at this and for the future if we come back to 40 again. So. Bill, did you want to add anything? In terms of making sure that the paint would adhere properly, we did a lot of testing to make sure that when we prepped the surface that the new paint would adhere properly and would provide the right properties. And then, then as I described, the paint is special in the fact that it has to absorb certain solar energy and reflect certain solar energy as well as reject heat. And, and because of that, we did some additional testing and then that paint will degrade over time on orbit. So we had to show that the paint that we reapplied will provide the same or the proper properties for heat rejection for the entire 210 days a Dragon is certified to be on board space station. So we actually use, like I said in the earlier remarks, we use data from the MISI, the materials and space experiment on board space station to determine what we thought the erosion rate of this new paint we applied. So we did a lot of work to make sure the surface prep was correct, the paint would adhere, and the paint would uh, persevere through the entire orbit duration in the atomic oxygen environment in space. So this was a pretty sophisticated activity to, to repair this, this paint and make sure that it's gonna perform the way it, it needs to in, in space. And again, a tremendous amount of testing was done here in Hawthorne. A tremendous amount of hours were spent here getting prepped to make sure that when we did this, we did it right and we actually put the vehicle back essentially to the regular configuration or ready to go fly and, and serve the entire mission duration that's supposed to. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. We had um, only two more in the room. Go ahead. Um, the one after him. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, Don Halajit for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. My question is for Dina. You alluded to the larger normal complement of crew. What are the conditions like? How's the CO2, water consumption, plumbing? How's it all handling with the extra people on board? Okay, well, actually, um, if things are going great, um, we do have some considerations, uh, I'd say. So, for example, 
uh, our crews uh, drink more water, produce more urine, and so we've been doing more urine processing, for example. Um, we have had to take a look at our upcoming cargo manifests, uh, and so, for example, we just flew a Northrop Grumman mission, and we're about to fly the SpaceX 31 cargo mission, and uh, we've taken a look at those and decided to add different complements of food and water as necessary, um, and, uh, and other spares, like, like toilet spares. Uh, you know, you've got more flushes ha occurring. So these are all things we're taking into account. Um, they've not been an impact at this point. We're, we're just trying to um, essentially make the trades in order to make sure we get all the right consumables on board. Uh, in terms of the conditions, CO2 um, is normal. We've got um, carbon dioxide scrubbing is going on as it normally would, oxygen generation, all the things. Everything is normal for the crew. Um, we have additional sleepers on board. So, you know, when we, uh, we have sort of locations that are temporary locations, um, for example, we've got a place in Columbus, uh, a place in the gym. And then when we have a handover with multiple crew on board, as we're going to have with the Crew 8 team when they get on board, we also use the Dragon uh, as a sleeping accommodation. So, um, but, you know, uh, I think that the crew is uh, very happy and healthy and uh, we're keeping them all good to go. Mm -hmm. Great. And we have two more in the room, Jim Manuel, and then we have two on the phone. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Siegel with Florida Media Now and O'Connor Space Tech. And I had a question about the uh, cargo, uh, the cargo that was loaded kind of at the last minute. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us what those cargo were and if the, uh, if the mission is delayed a couple of days, is any of that cargo going to have to be replaced? Thank you. Well, I'll just say from an ISS perspective, we have got a standard complement. Um, we do have a, a spare, for example, on board for a urine processor that was a later add, um, but um, it's not needed immediately. It's more just to get us up to a normal sparing posture. Um, if we're delayed by a couple of days, it, will, it would be no impact to us uh, whatsoever. So uh, from an ISS perspective, uh, we're, uh, we're okay and we have a standard set of, of hardware. In terms of the other manifests, um, if, if, that, if you're referring to what I was just talking about, uh, for example, SpaceX 31, if it was delayed, it would not be a big impact. We actually keep on board um, plenty of reserves um, and we typically have four months worth of reserves for any particular thing like food, water, toilet supplies, et cetera. But we have a lot more than that um, right now, in fact. So um, we're, we're, we'll be okay if we slip uh, you know, a, a few days or even weeks. Um, we, we're gonna be okay. All right, I'm in well. Oh, I'm sorry. Jen, did you want to add? Oh, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm not sure if part of that late load cargo is also our, our science late load, uh, which is nominal for these flights, and we do have refresh samples um, if we need to delay. Thank you. Sorry about that, Jen. Okay, Manuel, and then we'll go to the phones. Thank you. Manuel Masanti, Exploración Espacial. Dina and Jennifer, you've been describing all the science and research being done on the space station, and we are getting used to every cargo mission, rotation, crew rotation, that all the incredible science we are doing. Uh, it's like we are using the space station at, at its fullest instead of science. Uh, NASA is incentivizing a commercial crew economy with uh, new space stations coming. Um, what, are you, what, what is NASA doing to avoid a gap in terms of science if we know the commercial stations are potentially having difficulties to get there. Uh, what are the next te the, the, the steps NASA is, is, trying, is doing to avoid a, a gap? And if there's a consideration of extending the 2030 deadline? Maybe this would be better for SOX, but. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, we really don't want a gap between our current platform in low Earth orbit and the platforms that will replace it. Um, uh, there's a bunch of reasons for that. One is because of all the science that we're doing now. We don't want to have a lull in that science activity. We could lose researchers and um, uh, discourage people here on the ground. So we want to maintain a pipeline for that research. Uh, and we want to maintain the, the crew and cargo transportation capability that we've worked so hard to develop. Um, and, and so we want to make sure that we uh, have a destination for, for that part of the, the LEO economy uh, as we go forward. So that's all really important to us. Um, it's very unlikely uh, right now that we'll extend the ISS past 2030. Um, we, we've uh, uh, got clearance to operate through 2030. Um, all of our international partners are working through that date except for our Russian partners. Um, our Russian partners are at 2028 right now. We don't really expect that we'll hear what they want to do uh, past 28 until p 
perhaps as late as 2027. Um, that's mostly because of the way their budgets work over in Russia, but it's an important factor as we plan for the future. So, so we're planning actively for how we're going to bring ISS home to make sure we're ready uh, when we get to that point to bring ISS home safely. At the same time, we've got um, development efforts for new platforms. We've got three um, development efforts with uh, different companies to develop new commercial stations right now as part of phase one of our commercial LEO destination program. Um, and next year sometime, we'd like to have a request for proposals, a procurement uh, underway um, so that we can bring in um, phase two of that commercial LEO development program uh, and actually start setting up the, the services procurement and, and give us a great chance for having uh, that destination available at the end of the decade. That's our goal right now to avoid a gap. Um, and and, and our, our main objective is to try and do everything we can to, to get that uh, new destination there before ISS ends. I'll just add from a science perspective that um, it is um, something that we work very hard to do is to continue to maximize science on ISS. And we are looking uh, as, in, as ISS end of life eventually will approach, um, tr how can we best maximize that and also allow for opportunities uh, for these new commercial stations and what types of payloads they would like to see. So we'll, we'll have a, a meshing of the existing and the future um, as we go forward. And so um, Jennifer and others will be heavily involved in trying to make sure that we have a good um, uh, connection going forward into the commercial LEO development program. Thank you both. Okay, our last two questions. Irene Klotz, Aviation Week on the phone. Thanks, Megan. Um, my question's for Steve. Um, I know it's still early days, but in the three weeks since Starliner's return, can you give us an update on uh, where things stand with the um, assessment and uh, the work ahead and just, uh, I guess, where you would consider that program right now? Thanks. Yeah, good, good question, Irene. The, the vehicle is back uh, here at the Boeing facility. They have the vehicle uh, here and got the data off of it. They're starting to look at all the parts that they want to inspect. Um, next week, we start a series of the data reviews. Uh, this is the normal review cycle for all the systems on the vehicle, the guidance navigation control, uh, the flight computers, uh, ECLIS, life support, windows, structures, all those sorts of things will start uh, with our team, and so they've been working through that. Uh, the Boeing team has been organizing to look at uh, their redesign activity. When I say redesign, not necessarily a thruster redesign, but uh, how we maybe fly the vehicle differently, how we maybe change the thermal blanket configuration uh, in those the dog houses in each of the four dog houses on the service module, how we fly the vehicle differently. They have organized the teams and started to look at that activity. There's already some ideas about, uh, we've talked about the aft part of that service module doghouse where we have the three orbital maneuvering uh, and attitude control engines and the, and the RCS thrusters, the reaction control thrusters. Is there a way to put some shielding around some of those to, to keep the, the heat soak back from happening? Um, the Boeing team also is looking at the, the helium uh, system and we talked about the leaks during that flight. Uh, they've got uh, four different seal materials uh, that they are looking at in that flange on the RCS thrusters that they're evaluating to replace it. So the, the activity is moving forward for the next flight. Uh, the Boeing team's making progress, and I look forward to spending a little bit more time on that when we get to the, this Crew 9 mission launched and then Crew 8 returned. So. All right, and finally, Tariq Malik, space.com, also on the phone. Hello, thank you very much for uh, uh, for the opportunity. And my primary question is for Bill Gershenmeyer about the new capability of having a crude launch pad at uh, SLC-40. Uh, uh, I'm curious, aside from the obvious of being able to launch you know, astronauts from that pad there, what other benefits will it bring uh, in terms of flexibility of pad operations at both 39A and uh, SLC-40? Uh, would, would you be open to, I guess, dual uh, crude launches, or does it allow you to uh, switch crew flights to Slick 40 while you uh, build out the Starship uh, pad uh, at uh, 39A. Thank you. Yeah, I think operating off of Pad 40 gives us a lot of unique capabilities that we can take advantage of. 
You know, right now we're getting ready for a very demanding mission uh, for NASA, Europa Clipper. And that's going to launch a Falcon Heavy off of 39A. So we're in the process of reconfiguring pad 39A and getting that heavy booster ready to go fly. So if we had just the one pad, we would not be able to go support Europa Clipper and this Crew-9 mission. So being able to move crew from 39A over to 40 allows us to support this unique NASA mission, Europa Clipper, which is a very demanding mission for us with Falcon Heavy, as well as support a crew mission. So it gives us that flexibility to move back and forth. The same thing can come the other way, that if we have some Starlinks that we need to fly off of 40, we can go back to 39A. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to do things back and forth. It also allows us to put two crew missions pretty close together, back to back, and, and see where we are if we need to do that. So I think it's it's neat to have a backup capability, or if something happens to a pad, or or there's some damage to a pad, or we need to take a pad down for maintenance, having that backup and that flexible capability to go another way is is really an added advantage. I think as you've seen here through this demonstration and, and what we're doing here with, with Crew 8 and Crew 9 and the Starliner activities, the ability to have flexibility and to change and be agile, as was discussed earlier by the other folks, is tremendously important for spaceflight. You have to be agile, you need to be able to react what situations come up, you need to have teamwork and you have to need precision to deliver really quality and safe hardware to go fly. That's what really makes a vibrant space program. So I think having these two pads, tying these things together, being able to do multiple missions, being able to work as one big team really allows us to do amazing things as we move forward in space. So I see bringing Pad 40 on as a tremendous advantage and a nice tool to have in our toolbox that we're going to use in pretty innovative and creative ways going forward. And with that, let's wrap up this press briefing again. Thank you so much to our panelists as well as those who asked questions. Again, for your interest in the space program, we deeply appreciate that. Uh, live coverage of launch will begin at 9.10 a.m. with Nick and Alexander suiting up for hopefully, for hopefully that 1.17 p.m. Eastern Time launch. You can watch coverage on our NASA Plus app and our social media platforms. Until then, thank you and go Crew 9. <laughs>